Welcome back. This is episode 4 of Banking APIs with the Temenos Interaction Framework. We're going to be looking at how to handle errors in your APIs, how to communicate these errors back to clients. So let's get started. Recall from the earlier episode that posting to new provides an entry that can be used to input a new deal. So if I post this now, this entry, I'm returned a pre-populated field defaulted customer. If I then copy that and use that as my post body to the input, so I've got a new customer number now, and I input it, we expect to get some errors. And we'll get these errors because we don't fulfill the mandatory field criteria. So we click send, away it goes, and T24 has returned some errors. Now the first thing to notice is that we've got a good HTTP status code here, a 400 error, meaning that it's a bad request, or there's something wrong with the request. And there's no point in retrying this because we'll get the same result. If it was a 500 error, we could assume there's been a problem on the server, and it might be appropriate to retry it. So we use these errors correctly to these error status codes correctly to communicate errors back to the client. The body is also changed. So you can see here that we've been returned an errors payload that has a number of different T24 errors coming back. So we can see by just reading them that there's a, a short name error or some non-fatal error, input missing. And the way to get these errors to go through is to provide the missing details. If we go and have a look at the screen now, the customer create screen, we can have a look at how this screen's been designed. And you can see these little red indicators are showing the fields that are actually mandatory. So now that we've got a good idea of what fields are mandatory, as an API developer, we're going to want to create an integration test. One test that uh, proves the customer create happens okay when we provide the mandatory details. And another test to prove that the errors are returned for the when we don't provide the mandatory fields. So we're going to do that now. So here in my little project, I have this iris folder where I have already written a couple of integration tests. If I take a quick look at this customer, this create customer integration test, you can see that I've got a few tests here to create and create with address and create with a bad address. If I just run that now after deploying the application, this is a normal JUnit test. Just uh, change the view where you can see it. Run that again. You can see they all pass. And so they're connecting, if you look at the test here, they're doing a post to the new, so they're connecting to our, our server that provides that uh, default entry, putting in the mandatory details, and then posting to the input link, and they all pass. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show what happens if there was some kind of regression. So maybe someone changed this uh, field here, name2, to mandatory, without considering the impact on the API developer. So luckily, you've written your test and you've captured the contract that you established with your API clients. So if I deploy this now by either right clicking on the model here or pressing Control G, generate code, that is reconfiguring T24 to expect this new mandatory field. So if I run that test again, I should see some failures. API clients are expecting uh, to not provide that mandatory detail. So you can see here I've expected a 201, 201 created status code, but I've actually received a 400. So the API contract has changed. And you use these tests to understand how the API works and to verify the expected behavior for your clients. So if you're developing the API, you should have tests and if you're an API consumer, you'll probably have tests to you know, exercise the API and make sure it works and carry on working the way you expect.
So you, you've seen a couple of things there, this uh, rapid publishing of the details for T24. I can just change those details back now and run my tests again. And they all pass once more. So once we've written those tests, we're getting very close to having a um, development pipeline and being able to make changes and verify that everything's still working properly. Okay, so let's try and take that a step further now. If I'm going to offer an API to accept customers or create lots of customers, I want to automate, I'm probably in the process of automating um, that, that, that customer creation, and I want to make this as automated as possible. So that might mean capturing additional details like postcode, or road or house number, like I've added here. But it also might mean validating those addresses. So I might use a service like this that takes in an address and validates it. Now you can see this is actually in uh, Danish and validates Danish addresses. But for the purpose of our demo, it will, it will serve the purpose of validating the address and making sure that these incoming customers are actually valid. So the first thing is to look at where these fields came from. Now T24 has this ability to add local reference fields, which we def define in Design Studio. And if we have a look at this local reference fields domain here, you can see I've added a field called address postcode, address road, and I've also added that to this extended customer application. So onto customer, I've added those additional fields. So this can be um, part of an automated deployment process, or you can simply right click on Design Studio, generate code, and push all of those local reference fields from my project into my um, Connect T24, the one I'm, I'm connected to in my Design Studio. In fact, I can show you that now. Just have a quick look at the Service tab to remind you how we're connected to T24. So that's where we're pushing our, our models to. If I also push the customer in now, Generate code. My T24 is now fully configured for all of those additional local reference fields. And once I had um, imported those into my design studio, I could add them to this version like I've done here. So that's our, our back end fully set up, ready to accept postcode, road, and house number. But somehow we've got to supply those details to this address service and get back a, a status code. So if we, if we take a look at uh, one of these examples here, I think this is address validation. You can see this worked okay here with a status of one. And if I try and change that to house number something invalid and send it again, right, it comes back with nothing. So that's uh, you know, a simple way I can tell that this address is, is valid or not is that if it comes back with some results or a status of one, then I'm good to go. So my API, just by um, virtue of adding it to this um, version here, will get generated so that it accepts those details. And so I've put that into a little test here, create with address, and you can see that I started to supply these additional details to the um, entry, and those details are then submitted to T24. But somewhere in that chain, and not in the, in the um, back end, we need to validate that address. We don't want to do it in the back end because that will compromise scalability. We want to do that in the API layer. So here, if we look at that um, API definition once more, so we go into customer infos, we go into the create new customer, we find the input link, you can see here I've added this orchestration. So when we're posted a new customer, when we're posted a new one of these, we first call this validate address command and then call the input to T24. We don't ever want to do a, a transaction here, do two calls to a system, but we do want to do things like this validation or this kind of orchestration. That's, that's a good thing to do here. So I'll just quickly show you how that wiring up works. There's this command defined with validate address. There's in my Iris project a another command has been defined. 
this validate address. You can see here it's this demo uh, validate address command that I've created here. And that command is in a little project here that I've added to mine that um, takes those details in and calls out to this um, address service, just submitting them uh, as a query, just, just like you saw there. So it builds up the query string and we'll do something very much like this. So if I just go back to here so you can get the, the view of it. Uh, starting from here is easier. Right, and input. Right, so we'll accept the customer in, we'll validate the address, and then if the address is OK, we'll do the input. And my test here shows that quite well. So I'll just put in a, a bad floor number now, like we saw before. So more floors than were uh, physically possible. I'll see that my create has now failed because it's gone out and validated that that address is invalid, and we've still got a you know good error code coming back saying it's a 400 validation error. Change that back again and debug. That's fine. <coughs> so you can see that including this kind of um, validation behind the API. So no, the client has no knowledge of what service you're using to do that address validation, but it looks like just a normal part of the T24 API, validate the addresses and then accept them. So I think that's it for this episode. We've uh, had a look at the errors, and we've had a look at them publishing the models to T24, we've created some integration tests, and we've also started to look at an orchestration behind an API to validate it and, and get a higher level of automation. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.